Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, I am going to tell you a story about our journey of continuous delivery. Um, before I do that, I'm going to tell you some things that I'm going to tell you in that so you can follow along a little bit about me and where I come from and then these couple of stories. Uh, so first of all, um, to start off, I'll tell you what a continuous delivery means to me and then I'll tell my two stories and then I'm going to give you something to take home um, and remember. So before all of that, um, yeah, that's me. If I wasn't here, that's what I would be doing somewhere. Um, I'm Susie Prince. I am the head of product for ThoughtWorks product group. Um, I have been in software for about 10 years, um, primarily um, doing product management. Um, and I'm currently the product manager for a continuous integration and a continuous deployment tool called SnapCI. Um, I'll be talking a little bit more about Snap later on and some of the other products that we make. Um, but if anybody's interesting, interested in that, you can talk to me about it later. Um, and if you want to complain at me or say uh, anything, you can find me on Twitter. Um, I work for ThoughtWorks, um, and ThoughtWorks is quite a big company now. We have um, 4,000 people um, in uh, 40 offices in 14 countries. Um, we're fairly diverse because of all of that, and um, hot off the press, I wanted to share this with you because uh, it's particularly important to me, is that this week uh, ThoughtWorks was announced the winner of the uh, top com companies 2016 for representing women in tech. Um, basically, that means, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, it actually is really exciting, um, and um, ThoughtWorks have given me a really nice home for the last 10 or 11 years, so I feel really proud about that. Uh, some of the things that we do at ThoughtWorks, um, we provide um, professional services, um, but outside of that, we're actually really big proponents of um, software excellence in the industry, and we like to give back. Um, as well as, you know, make a living. Uh, so some of the things that we've done, um, we, a lot of my colleagues, they write books, uh, they do speak, uh, speaking events, um, and we also um, build some products, some of which are open source and you may be familiar with. Um, we made the first continuous integration server, Cruise Control, which I think I heard somebody mention yesterday. Um, and the first continuous delivery server uh, with pipelines uh, was not Jenkins 2, um, it is GoCD. Uh, I can also talk to you about that later as well. Um, and something that might be of interest to most of you here is that um, my colleague Jez Humble and Dave Farley, they were actually thought workers when they wrote the continuous delivery book. Um, and if you haven't read it, I'm going to just barely touch the surface um, of all the good things in this book. So I would highly recommend that to you. Okay, so that's enough about me and all the thought worksy stuff. Uh, let's start with telling this story. So uh, I wanted to start off by telling you um, what continuous delivery means to me um, so that we can all understand each other when I go through the rest of the the, uh, the series of stories so that we sort of have the same baseline. I'm going to use the word CD probably, um, but interchangeably I may say continuous delivery. When I say that, I'm saying the same thing. So uh, continuous delivery is the ability to get uh, changes of all types, uh, feature changes, configuration changes, bug fixes, patches, experiments, all changes um, into production in a safe, quick and sustainable way. Um, that's quite a mouthful. So the two most important things are all changes um, into the hands of your users safely, quickly, and sustainably. So what does that really mean? Because that's just like this phrase. Um, to me, it sort of means like feedback cycles. It's basically the ability to put something small um, in the hands of the person that's going to use it as quickly as possible so you can find out if it's the right thing that you should have done. Um, so as a product manager, that means was it the right feature to build? Like, is it going to be what my business needs to do to enhance our product? Um, but for other people, it might be, is my code the right code? Or um, uh, is the configuration correct? Like, it's the, basically the ability to get this feedback as quickly as possible. Um, and it sort of looks something like this. Um, it starts off, uh, I don't have a laser, but 
uh, at the top there, that first loop, that's the continuous integration loop. Uh, it basically starts off with checking in your code. Um, I recommend to mainline trunk, master, whatever you call it, into your main source repository. Um, you build it, test it, and you get a result, and that result is your first bit of feedback. And then to build on top of continuous integration is the part that I call continuous delivery, which is you're continually putting that same piece of code, that small change, into um, different levels of testing. Um, they could be integration tests, they could be staging tests, they could be user tests, they could be into different environments. Um, they're basically different types of ways of getting different uh, levels of feedback. So you go through all these stages and the closer you get to production, the more confidence you get, um, the risk is reduced that what you're gonna put out there doesn't work um, and you, you're more confident when you go to production. So it's basically levels of feedback on top of that first continuous integration cycle. And we call this these stages in a deployment pipeline. Um, I'm going to distinguish continuous delivery continuous de from continuous deployment. Um, I'm doing that because I heard sometimes in the open spaces people are asking questions. I think for the rest of the talk it doesn't really matter if you want to believe what I'm doing with continuous deployment. I think um, the learnings I want to share are relevant to that as well, but I just want to be clear that to me, the real difference between um, continuous delivery and continuous deployment is basically this little finger here. In continuous uh, delivery, there's human intervention. Um, so somebody gets to decide when we go to production. And in continuous deployment, that would be an automated process. So my feedback loops would go through automatically. Every time I got a green build, or something was successful in one of those stages, it would move to the next stage in the pipeline and it would automatically de be deployed. And in delivery, someone would just make that decision. Okay, so that's, um, that's what I mean when I'm talking about continuous delivery. Now I want to tell you two stories about how um, our product group at ThoughtWorks got themselves from a state of maybe not continuous delivery to a somewhat better state of continuous delivery. They're two separate stories, um, one followed by the other, and then wrap up at the end. So the first story is about our product, uh, Mingle. Um, I think most people will not be familiar with Mingle. Um, so for those of you who are not, uh, Mingle is essentially an agile project management tool. Um, You've probably all seen one of these before. This is our particular version of it. It's a card wall, um, and it's sort of our main view, and it helps you uh, manage your work, put it through a workflow, um, and uh, it's highly customizable. Um, it doesn't really matter that you understand what Mingle is. Um, the main thing that you need to understand for this particular story is that Mingle used to be um, on-premise software, so we basically used to build an installer and we would provide that to our customers and they would install that on their own hardware and run it themselves. Um, and about four or five, maybe six years ago now, uh, we wanted to move that product to be basically a service, a SaaS software as a service product. Um, and so that's the story I want to tell you between how we went from a on-premise deployment to actually providing, uh, we actually provide on-premise and software as a service right now. So the story starts back in 2012. We're an on-premise product and we are releasing four times a year. Um, normally on a quarterly basis, um, and that was driven by our business, and um, we felt pretty good about it, actually. And, um, we delivered regularly, we were on time, we ran to schedule, we felt good, we delivered it to our business, we went out there, it was all hunky-dory. Um, our process we also felt pretty good about. We had really nice um, continuous integration. We were doing uh, trunk-based development, and everybody committed into that main line multiple times a day. We had a high degree of automated testing, um, and every single commit went through this automated testing suite. Um, I think on a daily basis, we automatically deployed to a staging environment, so anybody could actually get one of those installers that we built and test it on their local machine if they wanted to. And then on a somewhat regular basis, we actually had a 
a different staging environment. I called it user testing, just so you can understand it here, that basically went out to ThoughtWorks. So this is to our bigger business um, at the time, probably about 2,000 people, where they could sort of dog food this and use it themselves. This was also, I believe, an automated um, process at the time. Um, but we didn't release that regularly to our customers, so we were doing this part of our process fairly regularly. But the final part where we went actually out to production, like I said, was just uh, once uh, every quarter. Um, and at that point of time, we, you know, we actually felt pretty good about it, like I said. Um, but we started to think about moving to the cloud. Um, and I was the product manager for this product at the time. Um, there I am, that's my donut. Um, I started to think about, okay, like, what is this gonna mean for us to like, have this installed product and then also be out in the cloud? And um, I probably got ahead of myself. I was talking about feature toggling. I was talking about um, you know, A-B testing, turning things off for some set of users, turning it off, trying it out, doing all these experiments. Um, and we all got like all really excited um, and then we sort of, took a step back and thought about our process and said, like, are we really ready? Like, can we just go ahead and do that? And we sort of really needed to reassess what we were doing. Um, and one of the things that we found when we looked at our cycle time um, is that um, we really noticed that about 25% of our release cycle, so that three-month cycle that we were running to, was actually in that tiny last bit of the process at the very end, um, the piece that we didn't do very often, um, and uh, actually took up a considerable amount of time, I think sometimes up to three or four weeks in that three-month cycle. We'd kind of been frustrated by this before, but there was no real driver for us to change it. We thought automating those tests was actually going to be costly and perhaps not worth it. Um, it was only when we were really driven by that business need and the want to be able to move to SaaS that we actually reassessed that. Uh, so we, um, we reassessed it and we actually decided that we could automate those tests instead. Um, but automating them and putting it the, them at the end, we actually felt like wasn't the right thing to do. So what we ultimately ended up doing is we moved from these manual tests at the very end of our process and we brought them forward um, and we actually put in these installer tests um, into our process a lot further on. This meant that they happened more regularly um, and we got feedback sooner about whether there would be a problem. Um, because one of the things we learned in that three weeks is that actually there were problems. So the three weeks wasn't just testing, the three weeks had been like fixing. So we decided to move it forward, get the feedback sooner um, and get payback. So then our process looked something like this. Um, so we are obviously now doing a lot more of our process more often. We brought that pain forward, we got feedback sooner, um, and we were doing a lot more of the process um, before we went to delivery. We still were delivering every three months, um, because that, um, for the installed product, that's what made sense to our business. Um, and it still does, actually, we still only do that for an installed product every every three months, but obviously we've covered a lot more, we've got a lot more feedback sooner. Um, and this little piece at the end now, we actually have cut that down to about 5%. So we do do one or two days testing now at the very end, that's still manual, but um, we feel a lot, a lot better about that. So that was like the big, the big thing, right? We saved all this time. Uh, but one of the other things I want to share is that actually we, we learned something by doing this that we didn't expect to learn, um, and that was that we had um, hidden sort of hidden barriers inside our team. So um, we were a small development team. I think at max we would have been 20 people. We were all co we were all co-located. We have open desks. There's no pods. You know, stand up. We do all all the right things. Um, and so there was no way that we would have believed that there was a silo in our team. Um, but actually what we realized was happening in our previous model is that we'd get to an end of a, a release. Um, product manager, BAs, developers would have done all of their work and they would sort of move on to thinking about the next release. And we would leave our QAs behind um, doing some testing. Um, 
And when they sort of came to us about problems they would find, we would have already sort of moved on into this other world. And we sort of realized that we had this big barrier where they were really responsible for this piece of the process on their own. Um, and the rest of the team sort of neglected it. And I think that's maybe one of the reasons it stayed that way for so long, because we all didn't have the, the insight into it being such a problem. And when we removed it, it was... Um, it's actually really nice to like not see them struggling through that on their own and actually have them in the initial conversations about our next release so that they could highlight issues sooner, provide feedback faster. So I think the point there is that you, you don't know what you're going to learn until you sort of do these things. Okay, so just to wrap up this particular story, um, we moved our process to this process. And then when, when we finally did go to the cloud, which I think we did about... Uh, six months or maybe a year after we moved to this process it was actually so much easier for us to like take that step um, because delivering to the cloud we just uh, we actually didn't need to do those three or four days of um, installer testing and we're actually able to get to that process that I talked about had we wanted to do continuous um, deployment and automatically go to production, we would have been able to. Um, we don't. We choose to have somebody make a decision when something goes to production, but we had the opportunity if we wanted it to. So that's what our process looks like now. Um, and it's been four years since we moved to this process, and the one thing people often ask me when I tell them this story is, but you spent a lot of time doing the automated tests. Um, was it worth it? Like, was it worth doing that? I would say, absolutely. Within the first year, the time it took us to do those tests um, was actually made up um, by the savings. And now, four years later, we're using that same process. It's, it's outlived the people who automated the tests. Um, and it's definitely um, made up for the time we spent doing it. So the learnings really are there. Yes, I encourage you all to automate. Um, you will, I know all of you will be like, yeah, but like we have this reason why we can't do this thing. So did we. It's not true. Um, you really need to try it. Um, you will save time in the end. Um, that I'm sure there's like an example that someone will give me afterwards that isn't true, but really, um, you'll be surprised how much benefit you gain from just the cognitive overload of like not having to keep doing that work or remembering how to do that work. Obviously, you've got to look after your automation, but um, it becomes um, a whole, a, a lot less of a burden, at least it did for us. And like I said, you will learn some things that you, you didn't know you were going to learn. We learned about the silo that we had. So that's our first story. Um, our second story that I want to share with you is fairly different. Um, this is about our product, Snap. Um, and I need to give you some context about Snap um, for some of the story to make sense. Um, also, because I want you to know about it. But, um, Snap is a continuous integration and a continuous delivery product. Um, it's also a cloud-based product, so it's uh, you don't install it on your hardware, we, we look after all the servicing for you. Um, and it essentially takes a check-in from uh, GitHub and helps you put it through a deployment pipeline, so the thing I talked about before. So in this, you can see I have a bunch of different stages, um, and my uh, check-in is automatically kicking off those stages, and when they pass, it moves to the next stage. So um, the reason I'm telling you this is that um, this is a continuous integration and a continuous delivery product built by this company that I told you wrote this book about continuous integration and continuous delivery. So um, one, you might think that we would kind of think we know what we're doing. Um, and that's exactly what happened in the case of the team that were working on Snap. Um, they were all really well informed. Um, they'd been to loads of conferences. Maybe some of them had even spoke at conferences. They were very, very confident that they knew how to um, you know, build this product and, and do continuous delivery or continuous deployment when they were in, the pro um, when they were in this process. Um, so much so that I think they got way too ahead of themselves before they even had a product. Um, they were just, uh, they were in CD Nirvana, let's say. Um, and if there was a checkbox for like everything they could have done, they would have done it because they basically, like they did all the things, all the things that you're meant to do. Um, they had microservices, 
They had Rabbit NQ messaging. They had Nagios, which is monitoring. They had an automated infrastructure. They had deployment pipelines, and they had containers. Um, we didn't have Docker. We, ha we have Alexi. Uh, but you know, all these things that they'd heard and read that you should do, um, they had it in there. Um, and they would have got 10 marks you know, if, if it was a checkbox. If there was a, co a cookie cutter template for CD, um, they would have done it. Uh, except for they weren't doing it. You'll remember this um, description that I gave before of continuous delivery and the two things I think are important, all changes into the hands of your users safely, quickly and sustainably. They weren't doing it very quickly. Um, they had not managed to get to um, uh, automatic um, continuous deployment. Um, they deployed about every two weeks. They weren't really doing it safely because when things went to production, sometimes it didn't really work. Um, so the users never really got hold of it. And if the users did get hold of it and tell us that it didn't work, sometimes we didn't even know why it didn't work um, because uh, we just, you know, it, we didn't have that insight. We had all these monitors, um, but not the right alerts. So we just didn't really know. Um, and so this whole thing where they'd shoved everything in just wasn't really working for them. Um, and they actually did, um, you know, took a step back and had to reassess everything. Um, and if my colleague was here, he would tell you the whole story about everything that, he, that they changed at that time. But I just want to focus on one of them. Um, and that is microservices. Um, and I'm definitely not qualified to tell you whether microservices are good or not. I told you I'm the product manager, but I can tell you this story um, about why the choices we made were not the right choices for us at that time, and I hope it's um, useful to you. Um, and the reason I chose uh, to talk about microservices is that a lot of people talk about microservices being essential for continuous delivery. Oh. Oh, well, you saw them. Etsy was there, I think, as expected. Um, yeah, people talk about microservices and they talk about continuous delivery or continuous deployment and how it's super important for you to do that. Um, and I'm not making a judgment call about that or not. Um, I'm mainly asking you to think about, is it the right thing for you um, by telling you the story about whether it was the right thing for us. So we did have this uh, microservices. Um, architecture, we had about nine different components, um, and they were all in separate repositories, and um, in theory, they could all be worked on independently, um, except for in practice, they really couldn't. Um, if we made changes in one part, um, we had to change another part, um, particularly around the messaging that I mentioned to you before. So although we had this cognitive overload, um, and one thing I forgot to mention is there were only four or five people working on this product at this point of time, and it was only six months old. So it was four people, six months old. They had nine separate components and nine separate repositories. Um, they had all this overload of remembering, like, which is separated here and what's, what's for all of this? And then when they went to deploy, they basically had to deploy them all anyway. Um, so sort of like this, the feeling that they should have had it was overwhelming to them, and that's why they did it, but it, it just really wasn't helping them achieve the thing they wanted to. Um, so we sort of, uh, we went back, we went old school, we put it all back together again, um, and we sort of let the design of our product and our business needs and what we were trying to achieve lead us to where we needed to be. Um, and so instead of sort of rushing to do something because we'd heard that you should do it, we actually um, sort of let, yeah, let ourselves drive it out. Um, so we are actually back here now. And we do have, I think we have seven components now, maybe, maybe, maybe six. Um, and, and I guess that's my point. It's not to say that you shouldn't do it. It's just that you shouldn't do it preemptively. And you shouldn't do it because somebody else told you. Um, uh, at a conference like this, or in a blog post, or something like that. So, um, yeah, my, my points here with this story are that I really think, like, some of us have the title DevOps engineer, or we're on a DevOps team, or a continuous uh, delivery expert, um, and that's great. Like, those skills are super important, and what we're trying to do is obviously make a change in our organization. But I think um, we heard this, like, yesterday morning. Our key job is really, like, to understand what our business is trying to do. Um, you can't just shove all the things in and achieve um, 
the ultimate thing that you're trying to achieve. So think about like, what am I actually trying to do in this organization? It's not do CD, it's deliver this thing or make this choice. Um, and that it's a journey, like it's, you're not gonna get it right, like you're definitely not gonna get it right. Um, but that's okay because you're gonna learn some stuff you didn't know and you're gonna make some choices and you're gonna make different choices to me and that's gonna be okay, um, that's important. So um, I think I have uh, just a few minutes left. I'm gonna wrap up with some takeaways for you. Um, and I don't know why, but the donuts, I thought maybe that would be really nice. Um, if you thought of these as like those little donuts, so I got to eat the donut at the start and then um, I had the donuts. So you can think about these as like little snacks to take away with you um, on, on your journey into continuous delivery. Um, so the first one is um, I encourage you all to practice continuous integration. And most of you are thinking, yeah, we've got, we've got that. And that's like 1999 people talking about continuous integration. We're doing it. I, I really bet you aren't. I bet a lot of people aren't. Um, you need to be committing at least once a day to your main line to be doing continuous integration. And if you're not, it means that there is some code somewhere that is not being tested regularly. Um, and I have quite a lot of things to say about this, but I really in encourage everybody to think about um, starting with the basics, and that means that your continuous integration um, needs to be um, successful in it, and it needs to be working well. Next little snack is that um, frequency reduces difficulty. Um, and this is really about the idea that the things that are most painful you need to be doing sooner. Um, so that is from our, our first story where we had the installer testing. It was like a pain in the ass and we didn't want to do it, so we left it to the end. Um, I encourage you all to bring those bits of pain forward. Um, and the more painful it is, the more you'll think about automating, which is also one of the things that I think you should do. So think about um, doing something difficult often um, and it will actually become easier for you. Next, next thing is, um, I just talked about this a lot, so I won't labor it here, but like being the, being the best at CD or doing a checklist of CD or following a cookie cutter for CD is not the most important thing. You really need to move up a level and think about what am I trying to do here? What's important? You might not need to do half the things I talked about, um, but that's okay because it will be your choice then um, based on the information that's available to you about your business. So I encourage you to ask questions about why we're doing things, why is that important, what are we trying to achieve before you think about, oh, I'd like to use this infrastructure and I'd like to use this tool and I'd like to like um, put this process in place. I encourage you all to ask bigger questions about what it is you're trying to do. Um, and then you need to um, involve the whole team. So I know this is really hard sometimes and there are silos, but I think um, we can start by breaking them down by maybe saying thank you to people. Um, like you really need to think about how can I um, make this not about me and my role and my team, but how can I make this um, a bigger organizational change and involve people? And it can start small um, and, and get bigger from there. And I think you'll find like we did, we had those silos we didn't know about. Um, really, really try to look for those. Um, and then the final one, I thought maybe people don't like donuts, so this is for the people who are healthy um, and want something else. Um, automate, automate all the things, do it all automatically. They're much, uh, it's much better than us doing it. Um, somebody once told me that, um, I have the benefit of not actually having to do it myself. Somebody once told me that computers do anything and I'm such a believer of that. Um, so um, yeah, don't, it's not true um, that you can't, um, or um, save yourself some time. Um, you will save yourself some time. You will bring the hard thing forward. You will get the benefits. It will give you more time to ask the big questions that I have encouraged you to ask, um, and, it, and it's super important. Um, okay, so that's pretty much it. Um, my final thing here is just some things for you to take away in terms of the idea that it's a journey and that it's not going to be easy, um, but it's going to be okay. And that's it.